<laughs> May the word of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. He finds a pearl of great value. He went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. How is that like the kingdom of heaven? How, if you don't know automatically, then maybe there's something that Dick Johansson wants to ask a question about or comment on. Sold all that he had. That's a uh, So what happens when the merchant sells all that he has? For one pearl. And this is says all. It didn't say all his inventory, does it? Putting all the one's eggs in one bag. When you do that, are you still a merchant? <laughs> he did not. He did not. And so if you have the pearl of great value and you're no longer a merchant, what are you going to do to live? Do you need to turn around and sell that pearl of great value in order to be able to keep body and soul together? Then you share it. Well, not really, because then if you did, you chopped it up, it wouldn't be a pearl of great value anymore, would it? Be a bunch of mini pearls. <laughs> that was a fire. Greetings to you all. I'm Ed Blaine. I am going to uh, work on designing the course. This is the third time we've done it at Trinity, reading the Bible literally, not literally. Now, that's not a knock against reading things in a literal manner. There are many things that we read in the Bible in a literal manner, but it is a focus on the different genres within the Bible. We have legal code, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. We have things that are poetry, Psalms. We have uh, the gospel was practically a new form of, uh, of literary achievement. Good news of God saving action, even though the word gospel comes and is derived from the Roman announcement that there would be a new emperor or a new person born. That was a that was good news. That was at least according to the Romans that you had a, a person who's going to carry on the great ways of Rome, right? So Christians stole the word and redefined it. They redefined it to mean not this continuity of the Roman power structure, but not that sort of good news, but the good news of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And that is really what the parables are about. Time and again, the parables talk about the kingdom of heaven is like. And so when we look at that, we must ask, how is that like the kingdom of heaven? And so to an original audience, a pre-Easter audience, so to speak, the people who were there at the time that Jesus was preaching, they are confronted with what was probably a fairly common way of teaching or interacting with the parables. And that is because it's a story. So you have a society with a limited literacy. And so the parables become short stories. There's a book, a Jewish New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine wrote the book, Short Stories by Jesus, so about the parables. It is a little warm for me walking around in my suit coat here, and I don't want to drip sweat all over the floor, which I have been known to do, so I'm going to drop that in my pocket. I'm going to take my jacket off, give this to my tie. I might even roll up my sleeves like it's the Scotts Monkey Drop. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> All right. So uh, one of the things that we're going to do before we dig in further on the parables themselves is look at the four lenses that through which to read scripture that uh, a New Testament uh, Presbyterian scholar Marcus Boring uses. And those are the lenses of history, literature, theology, and community. So with this, I'm going to hand around something 
The letter to the Galatians, we won't study this today. This is just simply to have for you to have a resource. The letter to the Galatians offers a really good example of one book that encompasses all four of those. First of all, literature. What is its genre? It's a letter, right? The second is history. There was a, this is a time period when the early church, when Paul was expanding the mission to the Gentiles. And so it is a, a particular point in time, a point of crisis in the church, and really the first and greatest crisis of the church was whether uh, Gentile Christians would be admitted to Christian fellowship fully as members without adopting the Judaic law. That was a live controversy, and so that was the history. The community, it was addressed to Christians in Galatia, which is a part of Asia Minor, a broad area. And then there was also the wedge of theology and the theology of Galatians. The statements relate to God's redemptive purposes. You are no longer slaves but children. You're not slaves to the law. You are children of God. So this is for reference whenever you get around to it, but it gives a good example, if you'll take one in passing, of how the... Uh, uh, you can look at one text through the four different lenses that I've described. Now, with the genre of the parables that we are talking about, and I suppose it's a subgenre that is found within the gospel because the gospels are not all parables, right? We are going to have other books that we talk about that, uh, this during these sessions. Amy is going to teach about the book of Ezekiel. It's a prophetic work. And it has all sorts of different things within it. It has all sorts of imagery, history, prophetic proclamation. Uh, the book of Revelation that Scott will teach about, that has, uh, even though the main genre is apocalyptic, it is also in the form of letters to seven churches of Asia Minor. The book of Lamentations uh, that John Gregory, who will be a guest that will come teach on, is a book that contains prophetic and poetic and other elements, including the lament, which is a particular style of, uh, of a sense of abandonment and an appeal to God. And then last, the final week, I'll be back. I should be here all, all, all the weeks, but I'll be back in the teaching role. Um, my career and I will be the letter to Philemon, which is a personal letter of Paul, his shortest letter in the New Testament, that points beyond itself to some greater issues to address, including in the history of the church, the example that Mike and I will be using on that is slavery. So here we are, we're back in the, the class that focuses on the literary lens. Our genre is the parables. And let's call out some parables by name. Okay, I heard two. Well, so, uh, somebody, who's a, uh, I think I heard a prodigal son. Okay, so that is, we were going to come back at that at the end. Sower? All right. Pallets? I mentioned the Good Samaritan. This is getting a little low for me here, so now I'm going to go to uh, initials. Uh, and uh, well, just one more, we'll put one more down. Unjust steward. There's also one with an unjust judge. So we have a few things where the unjust has come along. So what we want to do now is look at the uh, elements of the parables. I've got here what I've called a parables chart. <laughs> Some of these are on here. It's, it's kind of interesting. There's a, It's a little bit hit and miss. We're going to end with a lot of is what you folks called out versus what I had pulled out as examples. But again, what we'll do is we'll pass it around and we can look at some of the elements that we have in these stories and see if there is some way that we can pretend we can put ourselves in the, the countryside of uh, Judea or the greater, greater Israel, we'll say, in the first century and what these things might mean to us versus to them. So, did I hear someone say the laborers in the vineyard? No, the talents. Um, I, it is, this is actually fascinating. We have a lot of well-known parables there, but the only ones 
of those parables that in the Amy Jill Levine's book that she dives into, I believe, is the prodigal. She was focused somewhat on shorter parables uh, that you can get around fairly quickly. And so we're going to do the exercise on some of these short ones, and then we're going to apply that the, the, the way that we're doing this exercise to some of the longer ones that you've identified. So let's start with the Pharisee and the tax collector. Y'all remember that story? Two men go into the temple. One is a Pharisee. He reports on all his good deeds to God. The other is a tax collector. He says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. If we can get someone to pull and read that from Luke 18, 9 through 14, if I have a volunteer, everybody has a Bible. Well, that's a good question because parables are basically, um, we, what we want to do is we want to avoid jumping straight to allegory, which the church has tended to do. And when we're looking at parables, um, one of the best things that we can do is do it by distinction from parables and allegories. A parable requires no external key to explain what its elements are. A parable uses the things frequently of daily life. In an agricultural society, so. In a society where you have wealthy people, where you have injured travelers against America. So you have these elements. They do not have to necessarily symbolize something, and it's best that we don't automatically take them as symbolizing something. Sometimes it's a way for us simply to look at the parable and expand upon it. Whereas an allegory, you, you can have the key. So we'll have a good example for this in looking at the parable we're talking about. Yes. No, no. The the, the parables of Jesus were were likely just simply ones that he is talking to people in nature. They're almost like a once upon a time. You know, there once was a man who, if we think about that in our culture, so if Jesus is looking at at things, he's using the common elements that are around him, the agricultural world, the relationship uh, between individuals who are working folks and the religious authorities and the secular authorities. So you have a fair amount of grabbing things in the natural world to become, or, or your otherwise common experience to become the pieces that you use, the elements of the story. And we, I think we'll have a good example of that. Who has found, um, who has found the Pharisee and the tax collector? Johnny. So what are the elements of that story? The pieces that Jesus has put into play. Right? What else is there? Tax collector. Pride. Pride is a character element of it. Yeah. Where are they? So the temple's kind of a big deal, right? Yeah, that's not something place you go to every day unless you're, well, probably as per, per, a person of significant means and able to go there and has good reason to. Now, our impression of Pharisees is that this, there's the, this highly judgmental group of their opponents of Jesus. That's a picture we get, but that's not the only picture of Pharisees that we get in the New Testament. Sometimes Pharisees are favorably depicted. You have favorable depictions of Pharisees warning Jesus about, about Herod. You have favorable depictions of Pharisees who are somewhat aligned with Jesus, such as uh, uh, you know, two members of the Sanhedrin 
uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. So you have these Pharisees are not the bad guys in the historical sense. They were tended to be reformers. And Pharisees were fairly popular with the people by comparison to Sadducees who were the temple authorities. And that's where you had to go to give your hard-earned money and or you know, put it in, get the clean money out, somebody takes a commission, then you go buy your, you know, uh, sheep to be sacrificed for a lamb to be sacrificed for Passover. So we think of Pharisees in a negative sense because of a little bit because of how we've been conditioned, right? But they weren't necessarily a negative sense to the people at the time. What about tax collectors? How do you think people would have thought about the tax collectors at the time? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a good question. So we we think that. Do the people think that? Well, we don't know. We don't have a clear answer, but I think there's a pretty good chance that they do. So with the elements of this story we're coming in, we have a Pharisee who is a religious leader that you may like, you like the Sadducee, right? And you have a tax collector who may take more than his due. They did, yeah. The percentage of what they got, so their incentive was to um, increase it. And so if you're not good at math, and the tax collector is, well, guess who loses that playoff? So, but what Jesus does is he takes these elements and he turns them on their head, right? So now we see a Pharisee who has spent some time congratulating himself in our eyes. And we see a tax collector who is repentant. So I ask you this, what's the next phase of the story? What happens after they're gone from the temple? Think the tax collector's going to give up the job? Yeah. Do you think he's going to spend his collections to buy a pearl of great value? Sure. What about the Pharisee? What's he going to do? More of the same. Yeah. Is there a possibility, though? Is there a possibility that the tax collector at least doesn't cheat people? Right? We see that. We see that elsewhere in the Gospels. We see. Zacchaeus promising to pay everybody back after he climbs the tree. We see a sense of reflection and repentance. Isn't that the hope, right? So we have this surprising element with it. So to come back to your question earlier, when we have parables, we have things that are available to us in formats that we recognize. Um, we might have sports parables or business parables or things of that nature in our lives. Uh, the stories that, that people tell, if you're a Clemson fan, then your, your, your parable from yesterday is not a happy man. <laughs> Any Georgia fans in here? Y'all done good, man. <laughs> um, you can give me just a moment, because I think this is an excellent question about the definitions of parables. And uh, we have in this commentary on Matthew a kind of some consideration of parables as a whole uh, with a few more helpful definitional pieces, if I could find it. I did not mark that one last night. Let's see. Anyway, so let's go uh, to another parable up here, we'll examine the elements while I'm looking. What are the elements of the parable of, oh, wait a minute, quick one, the sower. You know, Jesus tells the parable of the sower, and then he turns around, and to the disciples, he privately teaches them what it means as an allegory. So that's an example of, of Jesus as presented in the Gospels, telling the parable and converting its interpretation to the allegory. The talents, who call out the talents? Tell us about the talents. What are the elements of that? Different servants are given a different, a different amount each. Um, and there's one that goes in and like and by the master, and then one goes and invests them. Um, 
And so that when the math comes back, it's like, well, I have this much, now I have this many, I have to return to a more, more basic. Um, and then I know there's one that like buried them away. Yeah. It, it won't move them. Yeah. So the elements there you have are three different servants. Each of them have a different amount of money that they've invested. And you have the master that is coming back, and this guy's this huge hard judge. I knew you were a hard thing. So I have buried it. Well, that first indication we have that the master's hard, right? Did the other two act like the master was harsh? That they may have trusted the master. They may have been responding to the master's entrustment of something important to them in order for them to do something. So how is the kingdom of God like that? Yeah. Yeah. So instead of running, yeah. 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 Yeah, then that person has to take a risk, doesn't it? That person has to say, maybe the master will understand. Yeah. 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 That's right. Some some methods take and some methods don't. Yeah. Yeah. We're called to do that. And, and, and maybe the maybe the simple part of that, maybe part of the simple teaching is we have to trust the master. The master has that teaching for us. We have to trust him to go and do because he thinks he's going to be away a long time, right? Uh we talked a little bit about the Good Samaritan. I, I referenced that earlier. What are the elements of that story? Yeah, he's one of the elements. What are the other elements? Who walks by first? Oh, yes. Thank you. Other elements in that. Uh, or, yeah, there was a priest, and there was a Levite, and, and the Samaritan. So to us, you know, I, I alluded to how Augustine allegorized that. Sure makes an interesting theological point. But what is the first audience here? Well, the first audience, the Jewish peasants, hears this guy's hurt and a priest goes by. Well, that's, you know, temple power structure, all that. Then a Levite goes by. Well, they're part of the same apparatus, you know, you know that crowd, they're not like us. The third one, what are they expecting? Yes, a good person from their community. So they're waiting for it to be, you know, uh, Peter the fisherman or somebody like him. They're making for it to be some guy that they like. And who is it? Samaritan. So let's go back. Do we know the relationship between the Samaritans and the Jews at this point in history? Not good. It's negative. Correct. It's negative. If you go back, you had the United Kingdom, the United Monarchy of Saul, David, and Solomon. And then after Solomon's death, the United Monarchy breaks into two. You have the Northern Kingdom of Israel. You have the Southern Kingdom of Judah. And then the Northern Kingdom eventually gets defeated by, oh, what is it, the Assyrians, is that right? It's the Assyrians that destroys the Northern Kingdom. And then the Babylonians several hundred years later defeat the southern kingdom and exile them. Well, there, there were still some people from that northern kingdom period that, you know, survived and they had their own sort of um, worship styles. They were descendants of the same tradition as the people who came back from the Babylonian exile and their successors in the southern part. But they didn't treat the temple as their space of worship. The lady, uh, the oh, the woman that talks to Jesus at the well, the woman at the well, yeah, we'll call her that. The names that we give these things also influence the way we think about it. 
the woman at the well says, you know, you're Jewish. Your ancestors say you worship at the temple. We worship here. What does Jesus say to her? The day is coming, and indeed it has arrived, when worship will be in spirit and in truth. So we see in her, from the mouth of a Samaritan contemporary, the existence of hostility of some, some sort, some degree, between the Jews and the Samaritans. A lot of times, if you were in Galilee and you were going to make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem to go there for Passover, what you would do is you would find a way to bypass Samaria because the Samaritans to you were heretics. They weren't like just pagans who happened to be, you know, Greek in their father's generation or their grandfather's generation. They were heretics from your own religious tradition. And that's really bad, right? You know, so when Jesus brings up the Samaritan as the one who is uh, doing what he is supposed to be doing, um, transcending that, that's shock to the audience. So there we have this element of the parable hitting us upside the head. Now, then what does Jesus do? I'm sorry, not, what does Jesus tell us that the, uh, the Good Samaritan did when we get to the end of it? When we get there, he has left money to care for the injured man and basically tells the innkeeper, this isn't enough, I'm going to come back and make it right. So we see the Samaritan doing what the kingdom values would be. Better is a parable than an allegory because if it's an allegory and you turn it into this is the law and this is the prophets, then this is hostility from an early Christian interpretive community to a Jewish community, whereas the way Jesus tells it, it's an internal family dynamic and discussion among people coming out of the Jewish tradition. Yes? But I wonder about the whole that Jesus was using that way. Yeah, the Samaritans believe you don't have to be in temple. You know, and that means that the point you can't make. You don't feel like that word. You should be, you should adopt them. Because that wasn't the You don't need to be in the temple. Praise God. Or or to want to be in God. And, and like, you know, there are a couple of times you used Samaritan saying, fine, it's here. You know, you should be good. Yeah, definitely something worth considering. Uh, that the Good Samaritan is found in the Gospel of Luke. Most scholars date Luke as having been written about 85 AD. Y'all remember what happened in 70 AD? Well, uh, the Catholic Jerusalem was, was, would, would have been earlier before well, the destruction of the temple. Yeah, the destruction of the temple. So, there, so to, the, to Luke's audience, there is no temple. What are we going to do? There's no temple. And for Jesus to elevate as he has. But the Council of Jerusalem, and then Jason mentioned that would have been a little bit earlier. That is when the mission had already been in place in Jerusalem. That would have been when the mission was open to the Gentiles with the idea that you do not have to adopt the Jewish, uh, the, the Jewish laws, restrictions, and things of that nature. So it's an expansion of the kingdom of God in a way that uses one's enemies. Uh, let's see if we can get someone to read uh, very short, Matthew 13, 33. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Because I bought that earlier. I didn't mean to buy that. That is all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the nearby standard version is my favorite one. It's the one I use all the time. It's the most broadly used and accepted one. He didn't place it in there. He hid it in there. You see, you know, virtually unanimous among New Testament scholars is that is a watered down word. She hid it in there. Now, why would somebody go out hiding yeast in something?
Pardon? Well, because it was supposed to be unleavened bread, or was that a That's a good question. Because if it's Passover, it's supposed to be unleavened, right? But we don't have an indication of Passover, do we? Okay, so what are we thinking here? Gotta hide something? Well, if you if you take that a step further, what you have is he says, beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. So what you're talking about there is this upper level group that seems to have a claim on um, exclusive control or things like that. Other people don't. But now you have this woman who's putting this leaven in and the kingdom of heaven is a little bit like that leaven. So does that, if you're thinking, you know, leaven's not terribly clean, I might go not just Passover, I might go super duper holy person and not put leaven in anything. How does that hit you? Pardon me? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so it, it becomes something else, something else in this mix. It, it challenges us. It confuses us. Uh, it does not speak 100% to where we are. Um, the unjust steward. Let's talk about the elements of that story. If you remember, this is where the guy's been, I, I don't know, he's been cheating his master. He gets caught. Uh, then after he gets caught, he, he cuts deals with people for them to give him some money so that he can pay it off. Then he turns around and he beats somebody up who hasn't paid him money and the, 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 the master's not happy about that. Well, how is that like the kingdom of God? Yes. So how, how is that like the kingdom of God? That's not what God does to us, right? I mean, so it's not that way. Th that's an example that is sometimes called uh, reasoning from the lesser to the greater. If you have somebody who is this bad example of what to do when they've been treated graciously, thinking about how gracious God is to you. So that ends up becoming one where you, where you reason from the lesser to the greater. Uh, the laborers in the vineyard, boy, there are a lot of elements to that. Think about it. You got the householder who goes out the first thing in the morning and hires people, then he goes back and hires people, goes back and hires more people, goes back and hires more people. People hired at the eleventh hour get paid first. What do they get? Standard wage, right? And then the other people say, hmm, he's going to give it a standard wage. It's going to be me. And then they go back in reverse order and they get the people who were hired at the start of it. And what do they do? Yep, yeah, grumble, grumble, grumble. Yes. Where's that in the Bible? Uh, let me see if I can find that right quick. Everybody in here seems to know way more about the Bible. No, it, it's um, <laughs> Matt, yeah, Matthew twenty-one through sixteen. Do you have the uh the, the little chart that I have that up? Yeah. And some of these we're gonna we're gonna do all of Luke fifteen, so I'll try to save time for that, which is why I'm kind of cutting through to some of this. Um, here's another element: the economy itself. Right, it's an agrarian economy. Is this a bounty year? And the, you know, or is it a bad year? Is it in between? So you have those. Now, I remember when this was the 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 uh, uh, the lectionary text for one Sunday, and the late great Bill Wisenhunt gets up to preach and he says, "Well, we all know the name of this parable. It's not fair." <laughs> so he gives this wonderful sermon. And then he kind of cuts his, his uh, eyes to the side and says, we need to be careful what we said because in God's eyes, you might be the one that came to the 11th hour. Goes and sits down. But what, the, what you have here is a denarius. And what is a denarius basically in this economy? It's a day's wage. It's what you need to keep your body and soul together and that of your family. Right? So it's not going to help the people who are hired last to get a twelfth of a day's wage. They might not even be able to buy anything with that. And, you know, let's just pretend that, that, that things like flour were measured out in a standard unit if they were going to be sold. Not going to help them at all. 
Um, it's also possible that some of them had some different work earlier in the day. Maybe these guys get a little bit of windfall. Householder doesn't care. He's agreed to be fair to the first, and he has agreed to a form of justice to the last. It's not sameness, but it's still justice because the person in the powerful position in the economy makes sure that everybody has something to eat that day. Did I see your hand go, Cynthia? Or... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Is it uh, so? What, what what's the view? I'm curious, right? Oh yeah, these are the exact kind of questions that we should be looking at here. I may have had a little bit of a printer problem with Luke 15, uh, so if you will pull in your Bibles to Luke 15, we'll be able to go and. We'll spend the rest of the class on this. I hope I've left enough, left enough time, but not too much. So that way we'll go. So what we have here in Luke 15 is the parables of the lost. And whether you are going from the handout or if you are going from your Bible, we are going to start with Luke 15, 1 through 7. And see, do I have a volunteer for Luke 15, 1 through 7? It's basically the first parable uh, on the handout, parable of Washington. Yes. Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Young man in the wilderness to go out with water. And he said, Find it. When he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And the public all together and the neighbor saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found this sheep that's lost. Just so I say, there is no sin in heaven over the one sinner who repents. There are only two types of people who do this. All right. So, what are the elements of this? First of all, the intro. Jesus is raising unhappiness among the Pharisees and the scribes because the tax collectors and sinners, those were the groups that we were breaking down into earlier, were coming here to listen. We hear, we hear their grumble. Now, grumble in mind, what are the elements of the parable of the lost sheep? A shepherd? We have two groups of sheep, right? Yeah, we have the 99. We have the one. Well, what do you think about a shepherd that leaves 99 sheep at risk to go after one? Not too smart, is it? What do you think about the unmentioned owner? If he were to learn that his shepherd had left 99 sheep and gone after the one, fire him. Fire him. What do we think of the shepherd and what he does where his values differ from the arithmetic? What's that guy like? Maybe he is. Maybe he's got a good dog. There's not a dog in this. Now, this, this is one of the awful things about the Bible. Dogs never come across well. Some of them come across only as neutral. There is not a story where a good dog shows up in the Bible. Now, I like dogs, so maybe maybe what has happened is that Christians have done a lot better job related to dogs as, as you know part of the God's creation than they uh, did you know, back in the day, right? So then we go on to this. I think different translations, and, but by the way, the, the Greek doesn't have any sorts of quotation marks, doesn't have, you know, 
doesn't have chapters, doesn't have verses. I think in other versions of the Bible, I've seen the just so I tell you there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. I think I have seen that inside the quotes that Jesus has in other versions. The Renewed Rise Standard Version has taken that out. Don't hold me to that. I just think so. What the heck do one stray, stupid sheep have to do with being a sinner? He's a sheep. He ain't real bright. <laughs> He's just following his nose. Is the sheep a sinner? Yeah, maybe Luke, maybe Luke's got a little bit better plan, bigger plan than, than that. Maybe he's not saying the sheep is a sinner. We look at it, oh, more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people who need to repent. Now, you remember, the scribes and the Pharisees were grumbling because of the whole tax collectors and sinners thing, right? So here's our audience. Here's our audience. The parable of the lost coin. Who would like to read that? Luke 15, 8 through 10. Heather. Woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so. I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Okay, so let's give Heather Cross for giving an emotive reading. <laughs> rejoice with me, not rejoice with me. Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin. But that's good. That, that's parabolic. Jesus's parables may have been acted out. Okay. I'm supposed to be these here. With the, yes, <laughs> a lot of us could probably relate to that. There, 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 I've got some hyper conscientious people. I like to think I'm not one of them. Now. Um, anyway, so we have is that the 80 20 rule or we would, we would, <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. Or like that, one point of ten is a lot of money to them. It's one sheep, a lot of value. Yeah, it is. And so the, the the woman apparently in the Greek, when she talked about her friends and neighbors, the implication, or maybe it's even expressed. So this is sometimes I wish I could, could go to the Greek and give you something more definitive. I can't. There are probably people in this room who can. Uh, but uh, at least the implication, and perhaps Brett. Is that the friends that she called the neighbors are other women? So you know, sometimes we get this imagery of a, of rigid um, gender roles within the ancient world, the early church of Judaism. Yes, there were gender roles. Yes, there were a lot of things like that. But perhaps it is not as rigid as we want to think. If we want to think about how much better we are now than they were then, right? Because she, this was a woman of means. She had her friends. She brought them over to celebrate. So it gets us a little bit away. Now, here, here we go again. Yeah, yes. Oh, yeah, you're preparing for that. You know, came next to me. Yeah. So you've got, just so I tell you, Luke, again, not Jesus, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repent. Now, if a sheep can repent, can't repent, what about a coin? Coins can't repent, right? It's possible there's something uh, repentant about what the woman is doing. I don't know. It's possible, but I don't see, I don't think so. So we have to ask ourselves with these two endings of these two parables, when Luke is telegraphing us something, maybe it's to build up our anticipation for the next one. Luke 15, 11 through, uh, let's, let's stop at 24, at the paragraph break, and then we'll have one or two little things on that, and then we'll go to the next. Who do I have volunteer for that? Okay, Nick. 
Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the young son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he'd spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the field to eat the pigs. He would have gladly filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hand, hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your, your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So let's stop there. But we'll put my switch back on. Testing one, two, three. There we go. <laughs> let's stop there for a moment. What are the elements of this parable so far? Father. Father has two sons. We haven't been introduced to the other one yet, right? We have a foreign land. What else? Laborers? Money? Starvation? Pigs. Pigs. Pardon me? You, got, you have an owner. You have all these. A lot of elements at work here. A lot of elements at work. Okay, so we're going to pretend we're a first century Jewish audience. The request to divide the estate is essentially a request. Dad, let's pretend you're dead and you go ahead and give me my share, right? Then we're going to go and we're going to go off somewhere and we're going to have dissolute living. Now, is everything that happened to the younger son his fault? Or are there some things in it that are not his fault? Famine's not his fault. Yeah. Yeah. He does some stupid stuff. By the way, who all in here has two? two? <laughs> no. And, the, and the, the, uh, the older son probably had a higher share of the estate. I, I don't know precisely what intestacy laws we're dealing with here or what will, but yeah. In some societies, it wouldn't be a family. A family that would not be more of a disrespect to the family at large than the five years of health. Yeah. Throughout large chunks of history, there was the desire to keep the estate in large portion intact so that you maintain some degree of family um, resources going forward. And sometimes the men, uh, the, the sons would get. The land and the daughters would get a certain amount of money settled on them, as uh, Jane Austen fans here, you know, settling money on the daughter. Yeah, um, and then uh, you know there are places in Western Europe, primogenitor, the eldest son took everything, and the younger son went to join the military and the priesthood, regardless of whether they were food or freedom. Uh, probably English had a little bit more ability to decide what happened than 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 some of the continental Europeans, maybe the French. Uh, a little bit less because there are a lot of wars among brothers among uh, Frenchmen from time to time. But then again, being someone who is of significant French descent on my father's side, I can say that some of us are right stubborn like arguing with each other. Uh, that said, so what do you think about the son's prepared speech here? 
Do we believe him? Don't know. Maybe, don't know. I think he wants to believe what he's saying. He wants to believe what he's saying? Yeah. See his logic, which is like, you know, I'd be better off if it or you know, like he thought that through. He thought that was really the Yeah. 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 She really doesn't like the younger son. <laughs> He's a very dutiful person, you know. So you think about that. Uh, Mary and Martha, no doubt that she would be Martha. Uh, the laborers in the vineyard, no doubt that she would be the people who showed up on time and got there. Some of the rest of us, we are a little bit more like a, maybe on our good days, we're a little bit like that. But God, on our bad days, we hope that the Father treats us the way that he treats us the Protestant. <laughs> George? Perspective. And this seems to imply you can decide to repent on your own without grace. That's a good question. Yeah. And yeah. So this is this would be Pelagianism or um uh, Arminianism, you know, uh, that you make this decision on your own, whereas the Augustinian or Calvinist view would be you wouldn't have the ability to repent without God giving you that ability as well. I think I'm going to her because if the younger son really knows his father, he's rehearsing these lines, knowing how he can manipulate his father and how his father will respond to this. He never did that in his son. He never had a dad in his father. And? Who and own experience have, have made the hardest problems, maybe because of their own problems or mistakes. Very often, you're not to be the most humble, compassionate, and effective servants in terms of what they do after they come through something. Your own amazing grace is a play train for Peter. Terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Where it might be wrong. I saw it up here among one of the ladies earlier. No, okay. Yeah, I heard around and said, I'm going to it. But you get ahead of me or behind me. I got those, what do you call them? Lenses, progressive lenses, yeah. 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 He will have grace of me. What he did is he he underestimated the grace of his father. He, you know, he assumed he was a grateful man by going back. He wasn't a grateful man. He wouldn't even try him. But, but then, oh, it's not grace. That's why. We may run over a couple minutes. If you've got to run, please go ahead and do so. Otherwise, we'll finish up with the part here of the older son. Who would like to read 25 through 32? I'll read it. Okay. Now, his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fat calf because he has got back him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat, so I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours come back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. 
but we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Now we have the element of the older brother and the relationship between the father and the older brother. What do we make of this older brother? Somewhat understandable. Somewhat understandable it is. I mean, he's been busting his butt, right? On the other hand, he's been living the good life. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't feeding pigs. Yeah. <laughs> worrying about famine. He, he has a little bit of an accusation for, against his brother that about how he squandered it that the text doesn't necessarily support. He's been with the prostitutes, right? Yeah. <laughs> so he's just kind of jumping to some things there. And yeah. So we saw that the father went out to the older son. Um, and his father came out to the younger son too. So maybe, maybe George, we do have the grace there. Once after the turning, yeah. So then we go back to the classic debate, right? So we have that. What does Luke not put at the end of this? He, he does not say, I tell you, there was joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. See, I think Luke's been setting the stage. Two good parables. Then maybe the greatest parable, right? And why may Luke have not let us reach that conclusion? Why may he not have nailed it down about rejoicing over a sinner who repents? Speculation is good because it is entirely a speculative question. Maybe we are. Do the parables, parables want us to fill things in? Is, is Jesus trying to make us think? For God's sake, I thought he gave us answers. Now here he is trying to make us think. So we leave the older son outside and pure, right? The father has gone out to him. <laughs> so you can do some lived experience for him. Now, what about the middle one? Is he a peacemaker or does he get angry by the mouth? Yeah. <laughs> so I think we're left with the open question. And the parables are often best read as giving us some questions. All right. It has been a pleasure to be with you this morning. Next week, please come back for Amy talking to us about the prophet Ezekiel. Thank you. God bless. <laughs>